I'm Chris Monroe. I'm an atomic physicist uh, and a laser physicist. My area of research is, is quantum mechanics in a very pure form. We deal with individual atoms and individual photons. All of our experiments revolve around the confinement of an individual atom or a set of, in, a set of atoms that are fixed in free space. They're, they're uh, levitated with, with electrodes and our probes are laser beams. We can interrogate what quantum state the atoms are in, but when we turn those laser beams off, the atoms are still there, but they can persist in quantum superposition states. They can be in two states at the same time. They can be in two places at the same time, a single atom, as long as you don't look. And so th this statement by itself is probably, uh, I, th I think it, it characterizes what's weird about quantum mechanics. And so our, our entire laboratory revolves around um, not just studying that weirdness, but trying to use it to build devices and, and uh, uh, build new information processors that take advantage of this, this idea of superposition, storing multiple states at the same time. A classical computer, it has inputs, it has outputs, but it only processes one input at a time. It's meaningless to say a classical bit is both zero and one at the same time. That usually means there's noise. In quantum mechanics, you can have zero and one at the same time, and it's not noisy. It's just the way it is, as long as you don't look at the system. So these two vacuum chambers here, uh, uh, each, each hole is a single atom, and they're separated by about a meter. And we're able to uh, make a quantum connection between the two atoms based on the photons that are emitted. There's these atoms, they're actually charged atoms, they're ions. And we can, we can, uh, we can trap several of them, uh, maybe dozens of them right now in a trap. And they're, they're charged so they interact very strongly with one another. Uh, I, I like to think of them as a bunch of masses connected by springs. When one of them vibrates, they all know about it because of, because of the springs, the charge. One of our approaches to, to, um, to building the system bigger is to take advantage of that interaction. So you can store, say, 10 atoms that interact very strongly, but they're all shielded from the environment. And you use a laser beam to poke on an individual atom, for instance. And you can use that interaction to make, to move information around and, and, and make what's called an entangled state. Now, Entanglement allows you to make a connection between the two quantum bits without any physical interaction. And entanglement is what makes uh, quantum information work. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance, but I think of it as a hidden wiring. that uh, You don't have to actually make a, a, a wire between these two systems. They're inherently hooked together. In an entangled state, my individual coin has an indefinite state. If I, if I repeat the experiment many times, I'll see heads and tails. I'll see a head, I'll see another head, I'll see tails. It'll be like flipping a random coin. But you're gonna be getting a correlated answer to mine. So it's, it's having randomness on the individual system, but correlation over, over, a, over a, a multiple system. Okay. And so that's entanglement and that's impossible classically. It's useful for cryptography. If, we have, if, if I have a million of these coins, each of them is pairwise correlated with your coin and I want to send secret messages to you on Jupiter, um, we now have a correlated random bit stream. We can't know it ahead of time. We have to make measurements. So quantum cryptography is a big application in quantum information science right now. Being able to securely send information where the security is guaranteed by nature. It's guaranteed by the laws of quantum mechanics. But another one of our projects deals with the communication of these same atoms, but through photons, through light. And in this case, the atoms can be very far apart. And, and uh, in one of the projects, well, we have them a meter apart. They're in separate vacuum chambers, but they could just easily be 100 meters apart. And in principle, I think they could be 100 kilometers apart. But uh, since our lab is here, we're able to, of course, do uh, some of the simple experiments, coupling a me quantum memory to a photon, and then back into another quantum memory. So that's another way of making entanglement, but it's not through the coupled springs of atoms that are very close to each other, but it's through uh, an interaction with, with light, with photons. I think everybody, when they hear what teleportation is, they think of, they think of Star Trek and they think of, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the transporter. For a transporter to work, um, I think of it in terms of not really needing to move the body, the person, from A to B, 
but you just need to move the information that represents that person. It's a rather, I would say, sterile way to look at what life is, but uh, after all, we're made of, of uh, 10 to the 25 atoms, and each one of those atoms has some quantum state. It's called quantum teleportation, but it's really more of a, a flow of information. It's a mapping. It's a, it's a rudimentary part of any, any quantum information processor, moving information between memory. And we do it through photons, which allows us to put these memories at a, at a good distance apart from each other. In, in quantum cryptography, you can send information and you know it's, it's secret. Uh, because if somebody is eavesdropping, they destroy the quantum state and you can know it. What's exciting to me is that the, the field is really wide open. Uh, there's no, uh, there doesn't seem to be a uh, magic way to do all these things. There's, we're still investigating fundamentals, the, the proof of principle experiments. And I find that really fun.